ओम नमो भगवते वासुदेवाय नमो भगवते वासुदेवाय रीडिंग फ्रॉम श्रीमद भागवतम कैंटो फाइव चैप्टर वन टेक्स्ट फाइव ट्रांसलेशन एंड कॉमेंट्री बाय हिज डिवाइन ग्रेस I've been requested to speak on this text. Any special reason for that? Must be. It's an it's an obscure text in the sense that obscure means it's not such a well-known one. It's just it's nectar. That's it. Is that the reason why? Ha ha ha. You want to you know, discuss about that? All right. So I'll just read the text. It's not a shlok. It's शिशुक उवाच बाधमुक्त भगवत उत्तम श्लोक श्रीमच्चरणारविंद मकरंद रस आवेश चेतसो भागवत परमहंस दायत कथा किंचित अंतराय विहता स्वां शिवतमा पदवी न पाएन इंदंती अंतराय दिस इज द वर्ड योर इंटरेस्टेड इन पर्टिकुलर Shri Shukadev Goswami said, "What you have said is correct." He's speaking to the King Parikshit Maharaj. The glories of the supreme personality of Godhead, who is praised in eloquent, transcendental verses by such exalted personalities as Brahma, are very pleasing to great devotees and liberated persons. One who is attached to the nectarian honey of the Lord's lotus feet. and whose mind is always absorbed in his glories may sometimes be checked by some impediment but he still never gives up the exalted position he has acquired report shri shukadev goswami accepted both of the king's propositions that a person who has advanced in krishna consciousness cannot embrace materialistic life again and that one who has embraced materialistic life cannot take up Krishna consciousness at any stage of his existence although accepting both these statements Shukadev Goswami qualified them by saying that a person who has once absorbed his mind in the glories of the supreme personality of godhead may sometimes be influenced by impediments but still he does not give up his exalted devotional position according to Srila Vishwanath Thakur Thakur there are two kinds of impediments to devotional service The first is an offense at the lotus feet of a Vaishnava. This is called Vaishnava Parad. Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu warned his devotees not to commit Vaishnava Parad, which he described as the mad elephant offense. When a mad elephant enters a beautiful garden, it destroys everything, leaving a barren field. Similarly, the power of Vaishnava Parad is so great that even an advanced devotee becomes almost devoid of his spiritual assets. if he commits it since krishna consciousness is eternal it cannot be destroyed altogether but advancement may be checked for the time being thus vaishnava parad is one kind of impediment to devotional service sometimes however the supreme personality of godhead or his devotee desires to impede one devotion one's devotional service and you all hear that it's a remarkable statement i'll read it again Sometimes however the supreme personality of godhead or his devotee desires to impede one's devotional service For example Hiranyakashipu and Hiranyaksha were formerly Jayan Vijaya the gatekeepers in Vaikuntha but by the desire of the lord they became his enemies for three lives thus the desire of the lord is another kind of impediment But in both cases the pure devotee once advanced in Krishna consciousness cannot be lost following the orders of his superiors Swayambhuv and Lord Brahma Priyavrata accepted family life but this did not mean he lost his position in devotional service Krishna consciousness is perfect and eternal and therefore it cannot be lost under any circumstances because the material world is full of obstructions to advancement in krishna consciousness there may appear to be many impediments yet krishna the supreme personality of godhead declares in bhagavad gita 
By the order of the Lord, a perfect devotee sometimes comes to this material world like an ordinary human being. Because of his previous practice, such a perfect devotee naturally becomes attached to devotional service, apparently without cause. Despite all kinds of impediments due to surrounding circumstances, he automatically perseveres in devotional service and gradually advances until he once again becomes perfect. Though the Mongol Thakur had been an advanced devotee in his previous life, but in his next life he became greatly fallen and was attached to a prostitute. Suddenly, however, his entire behavior was changed by the words of the very prostitute who had so much attracted him, and he became a great devotee. In the lives of exalted devotees, there are many such instances proving that once one has taken to the shelter of the lotus feet of the Lord, he cannot be lost. The fact is, however, that one becomes a devotee when he is completely freed from all reactions to sinful life. As Krishna states in Bhagavad Gita, Yeshaṁ tantakataṁ pāpaṁ jananaṁ punya kāmanaṁ te dvanda mohanir mukta bhajante maṁ juda vrataha Persons who have acted piously in previous lives and in this life, whose sinful actions are completely eradicated and who are freed from the duality of illusion, engage themselves in my service with determination. On the other hand, as Pallad Maharaj said, Matiya nakrashna paratatsvatova mito pibhadyeta prihadvatanam A person who is too attached to materialistic family life, home, family, wife, children and so on, cannot develop Krishna consciousness. These apparent contradictions are resolved in the life of a devotee by the grace of the Supreme Lord and therefore a devotee is never bereft of his position on the path of liberation which is described in this verse as Shiva Tamang Padavim. Om Ajnana Timiran Dhasya Gyanam Jana Shalakaya Chakshurin Militam Yena Tasmai Shri Guravendamaha The goal of life, as we understand from Srivan Bhagavatam, is to live with Krishna, serve Krishna. In the spiritual world, the situation in the spiritual world is Sugita Narutane Shabha Shakti Gane Tusheche Jugalatane. The gopis are simply singing and dancing very nicely for the satisfaction of Radha and Krishna. It's quite a different situation to this material world where everyone is simply interested in their own sense gratification just like animals. And most living beings are in the lower species and those, even those who are superficially in the human species, they're also, most of them, they don't actually come up to the higher platform of consciousness which is meant for human beings. However, those who do take to devotional service, having come to this human form of life, they are very fortunate and then Aungtad Vishnu Paramang Padang Sada Pashyanti Surya Kiriva Chakshara Tatam Vishnu Yap Paramang Padam Yadji 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 Vishnu Yap Paramang Padam Then though they be living in this material world but always looking to the spiritual world living in this world but always thinking how to serve Krishna so Devotional service in this material world, it's compared to a mango, which is unripe. But if it's kept in a favorable situation, if it's kept on the tree and there's not too much rain, 
then it will gradually ripen and become a paka mango. So devotional service in this world is executed with the aim of going to the spiritual world and serving Krishna there. And when one goes to the spiritual world, then everything is very sweet and nice. However, the difference between executing devotional service in this world and the spiritual world is that there is a very favorable situation. Everyone's a devotee, everyone's pure devotee, everyone's completely absorbed in love of Krishna. Whereas this material world, it is not an ideal situation. Generally, we try, those who come to Krishna Consciousness, we try to make our situation as ideal as possible for our execution of devotional service. And what is ideal for one devotee may not be exactly the same for another. According to the psychophysical makeup they have, for instance, it's recommended that if a young man can stay a brahmachari, that is a better situation from which to practice Krishna consciousness. Whereas it's, married, it's recommended for those who have taken to Krishna consciousness while in a female body, that they get married. That is considered more favorable for them. However, for many men it may also be recommended that you you should get married because if you're not fit for living in the Brahmachari Ashram it means if you're not mentally fit for that or even physically maybe that someone has some physical defect or some sickness by which he's not he can't keep up with all the activities so that may be recommended that he also gets married in other words practicing devotional service in this material world means going on with the basic activities Shavanam, Kirtanam, Vishnu, Smaranam, Padasevanam, Arjunam, Nandanam, Dasyam, Satyam, Atmanivedanam but also with some adjustment to the, the present apparent reality that we are living in this material world. Apparent reality means that unless we are an Abadhut Paramahamsa we make some allowance for living in this material world. There's some interface. As long as we're in this material world, we may be practicing bhakti, but we have to interface with this material world, uh, even though our concept and our approach to life is different to that of the materialistic people, still we have to make some adjustment to living with them and for the material conditions which are full of obstacles. This material world, it is simply full of difficulties. Whether you want to enjoy this material world or whether you want to get out of this material world, either way, Maya is presenting various obstacles. If you want to enjoy material life, it's, it's, <coughs> she's calling, come, 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 come. And then when you come, she beats you on the head with a stick. And then if you think, no, no, I'll go, 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 I'm going away from Maya. And then she'll get a hook and drag you back. These are the different potencies of Maya. Avaranatmika, Prakshika, Prakshipatmika. She's covering everyone with her Maya illusion. And then when someone tries to come away, come up out of Maya, she again tries to throw down. So, full of obstacles. It's very difficult to be Krishna conscious. Even those devotees who are able to, which is not very often, but devotees who are able to create what they would consider to be an ideal situation for them to practice Krishna conscious. They also have so many difficulties. Just like I was saying, it's generally recommended that one a young man, he stays Brahmachari. So he may have what is an apparently an ideal situation for practicing Brahmachari life, may have nice association, service, that's good. but still he may have so many problems because in his mind there are so many attachments, or may have physical problems, or even if one is married, husband and wife both practicing bhakti, both very serious, still they may have difficulties in various ways, either financial difficulties or difficulties by the neighbors or the in-laws, or again difficulties within the mind, 
Difficulties due to material attachments, even though they may, they may, husband and wife may both be serious devotees, but they may have a, it may not be surprising if they have a tendency, especially in the early days of marriage, to be overly attracted physically to each other. So these are all obstacles on the path of bhakti. And if we consider the obstacles, and it seems, how can I possibly reach to Krishna? And we have to be pure devotees, free from all material desires. But then when we examine our hearts, we find there's so many bad things inside, and there's so many bad influences outside. We see that in Ajamil, he was a very pure Brahmana. But just by one scene, a man embracing a woman, then so many dormant bad thoughts in his heart came out and he fell down. Prabhupada comments that what was unusual at that time is a very normal thing nowadays. That which is so much disturbed the mind of a Jamil that he gave up all his pure principles. It's a very ordinary thing to see this nowadays. What to speak of seeing a man and a woman embracing even so Muni by seeing fish engaged in sexual activities. His mind became disturbed. So the whole material atmosphere, it is by its very nature, by the nature, Daivi Maya, she is nature, Daivi Prakriti. It is designed in such a way that we should not become Krishna conscious. So when we consider all these things, we think then, well, what hope do I have? Well, our only hope is Krishna. Krishna will help. Krishna helps his devotees. This much faith we have to have. That by myself, I have no hope. Prabhupada, even Prabhupada stated like this in his Vyasa Puja homage to his Guru Maharaj. He said that, personally, I have no hope for deliverance for the coming cause of my life. You know, like that. Personally, if we see what ability we have to become Krishna conscious, not much. We can't, we can't even chant one round of japa without our minds wandering. Anyone here who can do that? Who has mastered this siddhi? They are so much attached to the holy name. But our hope is that Krishna is very kind and that even if we have a slight shadow of some sincere desire to serve Krishna, that Krishna will certainly help us. As Krishna himself says, Maya is very difficult to overcome, but Krishna says, if one surrenders to me, I will help him, I will deliver him. Sakriddeva Prapannoyas Talasmiti Tayachati What is the rest of that verse? I don't remember. Anyway, this is a verse quoted in half of the verse, which I don't remember the second half of it. Quoted in Chaitanya Charitamrita to this effect that Lord Ram says that I, if anyone wants, Sakrit, once only, if someone surrenders to me, then I protect him. I award him fearlessness. <laughs> This came about when Vibhishana came to see Ram and said, I want to surrender to you. And all the monkeys said, better kill him. Don't believe these Rakshasas. Can't trust him. But Lord Ram said, no, I accept his, his sincerity. I'll accept it. He said, no, you can if you like, but you know, even if he is sincere, you can't trust these rakshas. Lord Ram said, no, it is 
Pradami Tatva Kamama, this is my vow that anyone who surrenders to me, I will award them fearlessness, I will protect them. So that is the faith of a devotee. Therefore, for one, for one who has had this faith, as Prabhupada notes elsewhere in his purpose, that actually nothing is unfavorable in this world. We talk about a favorable situation for bhakti or an unfavorable situation. But what is actually, what is the actual criteria? Is it that we have very nice ashram, everything nicely arranged, good association? It's very important in spiritual life to have good association. But sometimes we find someone has very good association, but he himself is not in very good consciousness. And sometimes we find someone in very bad environment for Krishna consciousness, with no good association, and they're very fixed in Krishna bhakti. So ultimately, it depends on the mercy of Krishna, which we have to reach out to get. That if we have, how do we get the faith? How do we get the mercy of Krishna? If we have faith in Krishna, that certainly Krishna will protect me. And also, I have this faith that even though I am the most rotten, disgusting, rejectable entity in the creation, but I have faith that Krishna is so kind that if I simply try somehow to serve him, even if I'm not capable to do so, that certainly Krishna will protect me. That is our faith. Certainly Krishna will look after me. Now this doesn't mean that one takes it as an excuse, that we actually act in a manner that we become the most <laughs> fallen. Some of the devotees say, oh, I'm the most fallen. That doesn't mean that we should, uh, devotees should think like that, but he shouldn't behave like that. If you see a devotee in the fast food shop eating some hamburger or whatever, you say, what are you doing? Well, you know I'm the most fallen. <laughs> you don't have to live like that, but we should think like that. So the question may come, that question came recently. Uh, I sent something out saying that as soon as a devotee thinks that he's more advanced than others, he immediately loses all his advancement. So then someone asked that, well, you know, how do you preach then? Because if you preach, you're telling someone to come to a better platform. So actually in preaching, one has to take the position of being in a better platform. But internally, one should think that Jagai Madhai Hoite Mui Se Papishto Puri Se Kito Hoite Mui Se Lovishto Jai Mora Nam Shone Tara Tunna Khoi Jai Mora Nam Roi Tara Papa Hoi This Krishna Kaviraj Goswami, the most exalted devotee, who can compose this Chaitanya Charitamrita, which is simply at every syllable full of concentrated nectar of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu's pastime. He has had the mercy to compose this, but he feels that I am more sinful than Jagai and Madhai and more sinful, more low than a worm in stool. Anyone who hears my name, all their pious activities are destroyed. And anyone who says my name, then he becomes sinful by doing that. Prabhupada explained that he wasn't just, write, just writing that in poetry, but he actually felt like that. So actually we should feel that I'm not at all qualified to say anything or speak anything or do anything, but somehow by the grace of Guru and Krishna, I'm engaged in this. And then a short time ago I was in the same position as these people or even worse. So I shouldn't think I'm better, but I should think that my Guru Maharaj is so merciful, he's giving me the opportunity to say something to these people. Actually I'm preaching to myself more than anything. So that is the attitude of a devotee, and if he maintains this attitude, then even in the most difficult circumstances, it may be that devotees are put into very difficult circumstances where it's very difficult for them to remember Krishna. They may be obliged to do something by the, by the social situation they're in. They may be obliged to do something which is not at all conducive for Krishna consciousness. In this chapter, to demonstrate this point, Shukadeva Goswami will discuss about Priyabhata Maharaj, who was a perfect Brahmata, performing Krishna Bhakti under the guidance of Narad Muni. 
But then, Lord Brahma wanted him to be the king of the universe, to rule over the... Someone has to do it. it should, and who, who should do it? It should be the best person to do it. So Priya Bhakti Maharaj was called to do that. He said, no, thank you. I'm not interested. I'm, I'll just chant Hare Krishna and go to Krishna. But Brahma insisted that you should do this. Now, although he was a perfect Brahmachari, then to be, take the position of the ruler of the universe, he had to become a king, which means he was involved with social activities, family activities, for many thousands of years. And when you, just like Parishit Maharaj, that's described as the, as the king of the world, he had to perform so many karma kandiya activities. But when the time came, both Priyabhata Maharaj and Parikshit Maharaj, after a long time, in the case of Priyabhata Maharaj, of performing his administrative duties, which are not conducive to Krishna consciousness, but he had the opportunity to come out of that and again fully engage in Krishna consciousness. The nature of his service was that such that it didn't appear to be very conducive to Krishna consciousness. So that often happens in our movement also, that you have to manage, if you want to preach and have an institution to be effective, there has to be some organization. And that means you have to deal with legal affairs, financial affairs, so many different things. And it can be very entangling. You can spend all day and days on end just following up some legal matter and then studying the law books and it's very dry. No connection with Krishna consciousness. It can be very difficult. Many years ago there's in Bombay, the devotees they were they had to go every day into the city on the train, squashed up in the train, and then all day they'd be chasing the lawyers and you know what it's well maybe you don't know what it's going, but they go to meet a lawyer, the lawyer would give such and such a time and then he's not there or he is there but he doesn't want to meet you or you have then you or then you have to take some paper, you have to try and see this superintendent of police and you can't the peon won't let you in and so many things. You can spend days and days just trying to get some signature on a piece of paper so that you can move it to the next office where you get another signature. So it can be very discouraging actually. And then all you want to do is chant Hare Krishna and be happy. Yeah, but for, the, for Krishna's service, we may have to do so many things. The one time, uh, devotees, they came back in the evening and they were, they were there in the arati and Prabhupada was there sitting on his Vyasasam. And then in the class afterwards, Prabhupada said that you should always dance in Kirtan, even if you spend all day simply with these legal matters. Because he saw us, the devotees would come back and they were standing in the arti, they were exhausted both physically and mentally, just, oh, another day. And then tomorrow, another day, the same thing. Prabhupada said, you should still dance in Kirtan, even if you are exhausted by all these legal matters. Dance. Krishna will look after you. Prabhupada explained that management follows preaching like a shadow. And he actually chastised one of his sannyasis once. You see, you have to do management also. And I'm doing. Tamal Krishna Maharaj, he was side by side with Prabhupada managing in India. And in those days it was all like legal matters and so many things. In the early days of our movement in India especially, there's so much struggle. Prabhupada was bringing so many devotees from the West because Indians were hardly joining at that time. And most say they'd all come and go. Very few states. It's very difficult in so many different ways. Even we heard some stories. Devotees came to the Mayapur festival there. One devotee arrived in Calcutta on the plane, got out, saw Calcutta, and he came, he went back and went back on the same plane. <laughs> There's some cases like that. What to speak of trying to operate in It's very, very difficult in those things. So Tamal Krishna also, even though Prabhupada insisted you must stay. Anyway, he left. So Prabhupada said that, well, you can leave, but I cannot. Someone has to do all these things. So it may seem like it's a great obstacle to our devotional service, even to perform a type of devotional service, which is uh, not 
apparently not very conducive to our advancement. And what to speak if we're put in a situation where people are trying to make us eat meat and so many horrible things. That may happen also. But, if one keeps faith in Krishna, then even if circumstantially the devotee may be forced to do something which is even against the principles of Krishna consciousness, if he has faith in Krishna and feels that, well, I'm so unfortunate, but anyway, let me, even though I'm not qualified, let me keep my faith in Krishna. Then Krishna will help such a devotee. You know the example of Prabhupada's sister, who was also his god sister. She was also initiated by Bhaktista and Sastra Thakur. So it's quite surprising that even though Prabhupada's father was a great devotee of Krishna, but he married her to a flesh eater. Mostly in Bengal, people are fish eaters. So I often wondered, why did he do that? And then I considered that in those days, even now, when there's practically nothing left of Hinduism at all, but uh, in terms of the old traditional culture, but still, most people are quite insistent in marriage about caste. That one thing, of all the old traditions, this one thing is left. Otherwise, the old traditions, wearing tilak, wearing dhoti, wearing sari, going to temples, practically everything. But still, most people, for some reason, because of prestige or whatever, they're quite strong on the point that their children should only marry within the caste. So you can imagine in those days, it's very, very strong. There's no question of inter-caste marriage. So it may have been very difficult for, for Prabhupada's father to arrange to get his daughter married within the caste to someone who's even a vegetarian. Of course, maybe their close family was also practicing these things, but you can't marry close in the family, it has to be somewhat distant. And there's also, consider, you have to get them married young. Prabhupada told that his mother had told his father that if you don't, you see this girl 13 years old, if you don't get her married soon, I'm going to commit suicide. <coughs> Nowadays it's illegal to marry at that age, but previously that was a system. They had to be married by 11 natives. So she was going 13. You must get her married immediately. So he married to a flesh eater. And Prabhupada described that when she first came to their home, they gave the meal and there was fish and she started crying. Why are you crying? Oh, I never had this. So then the, they were kind enough to make some arrangement. But she didn't have to eat that. But she had to cook for her husband. So she was cooking every day fish. She never had it in her life. She had to cook it. She went through her whole life. Her husband passed away. And she went on living at home. And we saw her in her, in her, in her old age. She used to stay in Mayapur also. And she was very happy and jolly, chanting Hare Krishna. So she went through all that. She just accepted, this is my position. What can I do? Let me chant Hare Krishna. So she was able to be, be because she was accepted the situation, that, well, I'm in such a bad situation. What can I do? Anyway, let me practice bhakti as best as I can within this situation, which is not favorable. So she was able, by the strength of her conviction, to come through and uh, she was a very great devotee. Now, in the modern age, there may be so many, so many difficulties that if by chance we get married into a an unfavorable situation. But the example is there that if we strongly desire to be Krishna conscious, Krishna will help us. And even in many cases, we may apparently lose our Krishna consciousness. Not that we're recommending that. 
But if someone has performed sincere service to Krishna, Krishna never forgets. And Krishna makes the arrangement that even if we apparently lose our Krishna consciousness, as long as we don't become offensive to devotees, the Krishna will make the arrangement, either in this life or in another life, by which we can again come to his service. One of Prabhupada's disciples, Buddhimanta Prabhu, he was one of the first devotees to push Prabhupada's book distribution. And Prabhupada, it's, it's difficult to imagine or understand how much Prabhupada wanted his books distributed. He was very, very strong again and again insisting he wants his books distributed. Even they were printing books, they weren't distributing in the early days of the movement. Prabhupada said once, if you don't distribute these books, I'm packing up, I'm going back to India. There's no use in my staying here if you don't distribute. The audience had no idea how to sell a big book, how to extract that. Who's going to pay ten dollars for a big book about Krishna? In those days they had no idea. So Buddhi Mandra was one of the first who thought, okay, we have to try and do it for Prabhupada. He wants it. So they tried and the first day they went out they distributed two books and they came back to some house. It's amazing. They distributed two books. How did they do that? And then gradually they increased to five or six and then ten and all of them. They were just astounded. How can you get people? People have never heard of Krishna. They're not interested in this. They think we're all crazy and we're going out and distributing ten books a day, so it became a living legend, distributing ten books a day. Now we have devotees, sometimes they distribute a hundred big books a day, or even some, one time one devotee even distributed five or six hundred, one or, because then they, they, they distribute stacks of books, they come up to people and put them in their hand, <coughs> take these books, once they got them in their hand, it's pretty difficult to get them out again. So, Buddhimanta was one of the first to do that and he went to Europe and Australia and taught the devotees how to distribute books. So Prabhupada was very pleased with that. But uh, by his, his residual conditional nature was that he was very passionate by nature. He used to be an American footballer actually. Have you seen that on TV? American football, it's, it's some, it's an, I don't understand the rules. To me it looks like some excuse for a brawl. There's something, there's a ball there and people just kind of fight each other. And, you know, there's a ball which they do something with. But the main thing seems to be just fighting. And they, they have these helmets on because it's a, it's, a, it's a very heavy spot. So he's a very big, strong guy. And it's very difficult to say no to him when you know, he's coming to you with a book. So uh, he was successful in that. But he's a very passionate kind of person. After Prabhupada passed away, he, he got into my, I don't know exactly how, but... Anyway, it's, it's not difficult in the Western world, especially. We hear how it's money power, it's very dangerous in so many... But uh, what is that? It's uh, just like a microcosm of the West, where everywhere it's like that. So anyway, he got into Maya, but then uh, after some time he got brain cancer. He got these bad headaches. And he asked the doctor, and he said, what's the reason for the headaches? I took aspirin, it didn't work. He's not, he's not going to work, he's got brain cancer. Aspirins aren't going to help you. So what's the cure for brain cancer? There is no cure. The only way you can get rid of brain cancer is when you die from it. That's all. No one ever got free from brain cancer. So he thought, well, what shall I do? I'd better go to Vrindavan. So he did. He went to Vrindavan and he passed away from this world in Vrindavan. So, he apparently forgot Krishna and Prabhupada, but Prabhupada never forgot him because he had done such service that Prabhupada couldn't forget him. Another, Madhudvisha, he was a sannyasi in Prabhupada's world and he did tremendous service actually. He really got the movement spread very widely in Australia especially. But he's also, it's actually very difficult to understand some things, Prabhupada, why he gave, even someone asked Prabhupada, why did he give so many young men sannyas? Prabhupada gave the answer, it's like an like elliptical answer. That, well, when the sabji is fresh, you should cook it. What exactly does that mean? That means that you 
When it gets old, then there's no use to cook it. You can't get any value from it. So Prabhupada gave sannyas to actually many of the sannyasis are very young and very passionate nature. The Prabhupada thought how to get more service. They need a little honor and position, okay, give it to them. Let them do more service. One, Adi Kesha, he, I think he was 20 years old, Prabhupada gave him sannyas because he was a very intelligent person, very capable, even though he's very young. Prabhupada said, he was a town president in New York, that time he had a big skyscraper building, as Prabhupada used to call it, in, in downtown Manhattan. It was a very prominent spot. <laughs> Hare Krishna. So Prabhupada said, I'm giving you sannyas. Because if I, you become a president there, there's so many devotees, like 200 devotees. I would say, if I don't give you sannyas, no one will respect you. Then how can you be the Tamil president? Who's going to respect a 20 year old to be the leader of so many people? The Prabhupada wanted to be so his leadership quality. So Mother Visha also is young, is passionate, and a lot of energy. He's very good at organizing and inspiring people. But, it later came to be known that even though he was superficially a sannyasi, he had several girlfriends. Hare Krishna. These things were going on. So Prabhupada, he came to know, and then what happened, he just left. When it came to be known that Madhudvisha, he left the association of devotees. But Prabhupada didn't want him. He probably didn't want him to leave. He sent telegrams wherever he might be. That tell him to come and see me. He didn't want him to leave. Even though he'd done apparently, not apparently, actually a very wrong thing. But Prabhupada thought he did so much service, he can still be engaged in service. So after some time, he came back to see Prabhupada. He was married. And uh, he should left Sanyas and become married. I was in Vrindavan at that time when Mother Drisha came to see him. I wasn't there in the room, but I heard that, that Mother Drisha had asked Prabhupada, that Prabhupada, I made so many offenses that will you accept me back? And Prabhupada, with, with tears in his eyes, said that, of course, I, I have to accept you, but you've done so much service. How can I possibly forget that, Prabhupada? So Prabhupada said that, uh, and then the Mother Drisha said, well, Prabhupada, Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, he rejected Chota Haridas for even a very slight infringement of sannyas rules, and I very seriously broke them off. Prabhupada said that, well, Chaitanya Mahaprabhu is Bhagavan. He can spread Krishna consciousness as he likes, but I'm simply an insignificant diva. So I'm, I'm very grateful of anyone, whoever they may do, whatever service they may do. That was Prabhupada's attitude. Very merciful. So we shouldn't take advantage of that mercy and think, okay, I'll, I'll take sannyas and, you know, if it doesn't work out well, can always get married. That's, that's not proper. We shouldn't think like that. One should become a grihasta and then become a sannyasi. Oh, you can be a brahmacharya and a sannyasi. Not that you become a sannyasi and then a grihasta. That's not the proper order of doing things. Although Prabhupada, he actually did very many Strange things that we see. Uh, not the, what's the proper word? Unconventional. To spread Krishna consciousness in a very unusual atmosphere. Traditionally, Krishna consciousness has been spread in Vedic India. Prabhupada was spreading Krishna consciousness in a completely insane Western world. At least in India, the traditional culture was somewhat sane. As far as this material world is insane. But somewhat sane. The Varnashram system that makes some kind of order, some kind of uh, dharmic order within an otherwise sane world. Prabhupada did many daring things for which he was criticized by his godson. Prabhupada said, for all their criticism, I'm spreading Krishna gods all over the world and they're doing nothing. So there were many discrepancies, actually. But Prabhupada was kind enough to see what is the desire to serve. So this is the essence of Bhakti. We should have a strong desire to serve Krishna. Even if we're in a situation where it may be very difficult 
if someone is in a very difficult situation, for them, simply to turn their rounds may be a great achievement if their whole family is against it. Krishna will appreciate it. They may not be able to do anything else, but Krishna will appreciate it. Because Krishna is bhavagrahi. Krishna accepts what is the mood of a devotee. And if a devotee has sincerely tried to serve Krishna, even if circumstantially he is prevented from doing so for some time, Krishna will not forget. Tatratam vunti samyogam lavante purva dehikam. Eventually, somehow or other, he may have, who knows, he may have had some desires, whatever, he became attached to a prostitute, which is a very degraded situation. But then the prostitute, when he came in the leaving, uh, quickly finishing up his father's crematorial rites, in the storm, crossing over the river, grabbing a dead body, and then climbing up over the compound wall of Chintamani's home, grabbing onto the snake that was hanging down and almost killing himself in the process, going over the high wall. And so he took so in the storm and the rain, she was so surprised to see him that you've come with so many difficulties and she said that, oh, you have so much attachment for this useless body of mine which is made of flesh and blood. If you only had so much attachment for Krishna, then your life would be successful. And Prabhupada explained that when she said Krishna like that, of course he was living in India, but he must have he must have heard something of Krishna. But when she said in that way, then immediately it struck him like a thunderbolt. Ah, oh, Krishna! Oh, I should have been serving Krishna. And immediately he changed his whole life. So Prabhupada explained that that's because in a previous life he'd been a great devotee, and then just when the time was right, that realization came, yes, I should be serving Krishna. So, that is the point, that even a devotee may forget Krishna. But Krishna never forgets the sincere service rendered by a devotee. Therefore, we can have faith in Krishna's words. That even if we are put in a very bad situation, we should have the faith that somehow or other this is some karma I have to go through. Because I was very sinful in my previous life, I now put into such a situation where I may not have association of devotees, or I may be surrounded by people who are trying to force me to give up bhakti. So it must be, we should think it must be due to some sinful activity of mine. But we should think that nevertheless, whatever happens, even if the whole world is against me, I cannot give up Krishna consciousness. I must stick to it somehow or other. If we have that attitude, then certainly Krishna will save us. Actually, if we are in a very difficult situation, that is a situation in which we can more, with more intensity, worship Krishna. If we are simply living among devotees, then we may take it very ordinarily. And we may even start to develop a critical mentality because familiarity breeds contempt. Instead of thinking that all oh, these devotees, they're all such wonderful, exalted souls, you say, yeah, you see, see that guy, he doesn't even know how to offer RT properly, and you see, he's <laughs> simply useless. And this familiarity may breed contempt, but if we're starved of devotee association, that's not a very good situation, but it may circumstantially occur. Then we'll appreciate so much that, oh, so wonderful, these people there. When we get that association, or even if we don't get it, we can meditate upon those devotees who are serving the Lord, with their given their lives for serving Krishna. So by that attitude we become purified. So actually there's nothing unfavorable. We talk about favorable circumstance, unfavorable, and that's true. There is favorable circumstance, there is unfavorable. But if we ourselves are fully fixed in our desire to serve Krishna, then Kaivalyam Narakayate, that Tidashapur Akasha Pushpayate, even the heavenly planets will seem 
insignificant to us. Neither we'll see anything as very good nor anything as very bad. We'll see that simply I am servant of Krishna and whatever the circumstances may be, I have to go on with my service to Krishna, even if I'm not able to do so. Still I shall try to remember Krishna. Or even if we're not so strong and we become influenced by the unfavorable circumstances so that we start to forget Krishna, still we should have the faith that somehow or other Krishna has put me in this situation. It's very difficult for me. But whenever I get an opportunity, I must do my best to serve Krishna. We should always keep our contact with Krishna. Here Prabhupada writes the uh, extraordinary statement that sometimes the Supreme Lord himself may impede a devotee's advancement. And he gives the example of Jaya and Vijay, who were forced to become Hiranyakashipu, <coughs> Hiranyaksha, Ravana, Kumbhakarna, Sisupa, Namagosh. So, it seems very strange. Why would the Lord impede? Actually, it's only temporarily, apparently impeding because Krishna has some purpose to serve through that. The same thing with Maharaj Priyabrata. Because Priyabrata Maharaj was required to rule over the world. If he had been simply a pure brahmachari, that would have been very good for his own advancement. But if he was the king, even though he had to be involved in so many social affairs, that was good for the advancement of the whole world. So Krishna put him in that situation. So Krishna may apparently arrange some kind of impediment, but ultimately he delivers. So actually the impediment is no impediment, ultimately, because Krishna delivers. So this is the faith of the devotee, that I should do my part to serve Krishna the best I can, whatever situation I may be in. Krishna will do his part, he will certainly deliver such a devotee. Hare Krishna. Are there any questions about this? It's a very deep topic, actually. You want to say anything, Madhav? You want to just discuss? When I was a few days ago, I was a few days ago, and I was very late in my life for a Yeah, yeah, yeah. There are some very Wonderful statements here. Whereas they're just around here. Just around here, I, I don't see exactly. There's this statement that the uh, the blessings of a pure devotee are very powerful to affect one's advancement. So even though Priyabrata was in apparently a bad situation, he had the blessings of a pure devotee. They're more powerful than one's own efforts. That's the what Prabhupada says. You remember reading that? You just read this a few days ago? That the blessings of a pure devotee are more powerful for affecting our devotional advancement than our own efforts. So personally, that's in my life, that's, that's a, that has been a very important statement in my life because, like I say, by my own efforts, I don't see any hope. But I know that Prabhupada is very merciful. So I'm just, uh, my approach to Krishna consciousness is that I'm, I'm thinking, of, despite my own lackings in so many ways, that if we simply, as Prabhupada is quoted again and again and again, Yatya Prasada, Bhagavat Prasada, Yatya Prasada, Nagatika if we somehow or other just get some drops of mercy from the great ocean that Prabhupada has brought, then that will deliver us. Otherwise, by our own job and all that, we should chant as nicely as we can, but at the same time, we should understand that the vital principle in our devotional advancement is not our own effort, not that we shouldn't make our own effort, but the vital principle 
by which our efforts become nourished and fructified is the mercy of Krishna which is received through his pure devotees. So please study this Bhagavatam. There are so many important topics here. More questions? Uh, by the blessings of a Vaishnava, everything is possible. There's that statement. I'm just trying to find exactly. Yeah, what are you saying, please? Uh, <laughs> We sometimes can, you know, force that we don't land up in a lot of trouble. And we have by service or the situation that we are in. So how does one um, knowing this and getting a you know, I might end up in a lot of trouble. You might end up in a lot of trouble by, by following the present course of devotional service. Yes. So how does one and you already have a lot of responsibility and Everyone in this material world is trying to make a, a comfortable situation for themselves, physically and mentally. They like to have a nicely furnished house with air conditioner to be physically comfortable. And they try to... They, in human dealings, different people have different approaches. Others try to... because it's a world of competition. So some people, they'll try to submit to, to suppress the competition by, by either physically or verbally or even mentally suppressing them. Or others, they may have a different approach. But when there's some kind of trouble coming up, they just avoid it or they just tolerate someone being a little nasty so as not to have a fight with them. So they can live mentally very comfortably. And people will avoid, just like you see, the in the civil service, there's called a hardship post. If you're, if you, if an IAS officer gets posted in the jungle in Assam, that means his superior wanted to do something, punish him. If if he, just like you see, in uh, one time we were having such troubles in Bangladesh when one of our devotees was devoted from New Zealand was arrested on charges of spying for an enemy power, very heavy charges, and there was a whole list of them. So there was no New Zealand consulate there, so he went to the British consulate, and we were discussing with the man there, and he said, this, this posting in Bangladesh is considered a hardship post, so they only give it to you for a short time. In some place like Paris or New York, you can go for longer. So you only get posted for a short time in Bangladesh, because there's no, there's no fun in Bangladesh. So, it, like that, the people in the civil service, in the British foreign service and whatever it may be, they'd rather be posted in Paris or New York than in Dhaka, or Islamabad. It's, it's, uh, they're trying to get a position where there's the least problem. Sometimes we also recommend to our devotees, you get a job as a lecturer because uh, somewhat reasonable, but not very great pay, but there's no, no hard work, no tension, no stress, not like in other jobs, and long holidays, so you can practice Krishna consciousness better. So in this material world, everyone is trying to avoid discomfort in different levels. But in bhakti, our attitude should not be like that. In bhakti, our attitude should be to do whatever is required to serve Krishna, even if we have to accept difficulties. Prabhupada said, do the needful. Just like Kamal Krishna at that time left India because he was friends. It's too much. Too much pressure, too much strain. And <coughs> Prabhupada said, you can leave, but I cannot. <coughs> you can give up this responsibility, I cannot. 
someone has to do. So we should accept, someone has to accept. Someone has to accept that difficulty. Or if we don't accept, then uh, if we don't accept certain difficulties, then more difficulties will come in future. So that is part of our service to Krishna. That we are prepared to do so. Prabhupada said that I want Brahmanas with the spirit of Kshatriyas. In other words, one should be a Brahmana, very knowledgeable, very clean, very detached, but with the spirit of a Kshatriya, prepared to fight for Krishna. Prabhupada himself personally fought for Krishna and enjoyed it too. Not only philosophically fighting, but fighting with Mr. Naya and the Bombay Corporation and all this for that land. And when it was over, Prabhupada said, that was a good fight. <laughs> So Kshatriya actually, although generally people are looking for comfort, the Kshatriya's inclination is to attack in the most difficult spot. They'll make the different formations and he'll instead, logically one should attack in the weakest spot. But out of his fighting spirit he'll, he'll deliberately look what is the most, the best fortified spot and attack them. That is his spirit. So he may have to undergo many, many difficulties. And sometimes it may seem that, what's the use? There's no hope. But actually in Krishna consciousness there's always very good hope. There seems to be no hope of Prabhupada being able to do anything for spreading Krishna consciousness all over the world. In India he was trying, no one was helping. Even he made some study in Jansi, which is not a very important place. But something was going on. And they had the, some building was donated, but then Nilavati Munshi, the wife of the governor of UP, said, I think this could be better used for teaching women how to do sewing. And no one would oppose her. All Prabhupada's followers and supporters, they didn't want to go up against the wife of the governor. So Prabhupada lost the building. He could have fought the case. But he thought, why should I fight a case like, oh my God, brothers, they are fighting cases for years. So he simply left. Okay. And he was trying to work with different God brothers. One of them was offering, we can give you an airy room, well aerated room in the mud. You just come and join us. Do what we say. I don't need an aerated room. I need the chance to spread Krishna Bhakti. So he went through so many obstacles. When he went to America at first, it seemed no one would take to Krishna Bhakti. But he kept on trying and eventually wonderful things happened. And actually in the Lilamrita you, you don't see even one-tenth of the struggle Prabhupada went through because many of them have been edited out for various reasons. All the things that went on in Bombay, some idea is given, but all the, you know, so much corruption, bribery also, threats, all these things were going on. They also, they were dealing with the corporation and they had to give some bribes. That doesn't come. Then there's some incident, it's lightly alluded to, but it doesn't say actually how at one point some Prabhupada's disciples, they actually made him a prisoner. They locked him up in his room, wouldn't let him out. There's some little allusion, they don't tell everything. There's so many difficulties Prabhupada went through. And how he, some of his most trusted men, they just, without any warning, just fell down, left all their responsibilities. So many things Prabhupada went through. One devotee told me he was in the room when he got the news, Karanda. He was, he was Prabhupada's right hand man. He was managing the whole room, expert manager. And then one day without any warning, there was no news that he was like slipping or shaking. The news came to Prabhupada, he'd fallen down. And it was a very big blow actually because Prabhupada had put so much management responsibilities on me. And what did Prabhupada say? He said, oh. Oh, Maya. Maya is so strong. Like this. And then two minutes later, he was, he, he was in the middle of talking, discussing some philosophy about Krishna consciousness. So two minutes later, he just changed his side and he was, went back to the same. He was talking about Krishna Bhakti and all these things. As if unaffected. Although actually, that would mean that so many problems would come by his falling away and 
So many difficulties would fall on Prabhupada's head. He just accepted it. Prabhupada was completely transcendental. Completely transcendental means that he didn't just avoid all this. He, he was involved in so many activities of his scope. So much. You know, sometimes people say, you know, well, after Prabhupada left, you see so many difficulties came because they didn't, the GBC didn't do this and they didn't do that. But there were so many problems and Prabhupada was there. You, you can't imagine. So many difficulties. Preaching Krishna consciousness, especially in Kali Yuga, is declaring war on Maya. And Maya is very powerful. She's so powerful. She kills big Mahishasura and so many demons she's killing. She's very, very powerful. So Maya makes things very difficult. It's not that when Prabhupada was here it was like some kind of utopia and then when Prabhupada left all of a sudden because all the GPC are all demons then it all went wrong. It wasn't like that. It's always been. There's always been so many crazy things going on in this movement and so many crazy people in this movement. When I was uh, newly in this movement I asked Mukunda Maharaj one of the first devotees who ever joined this movement. I was had an office service in the same office as he. So one day I asked him, that, well, why do so many crazy people join this movement? And he said, he replied, well, that's a very good question. I asked the same question to Prabhupada. And Prabhupada replied, well, you have to be somewhat crazy to join this movement. <laughs> From the material perspective, you won't find what, all the normal people joining this movement. All the normal, you see people complain, why are you chanting Hare Krishna? You're not normal. It's not normal. It's wrong. But we don't find normal people, they don't join. All the people are very interested in getting lots of money and having fun and all this kind of thing. They don't join. Only the crazy people join. But actually you have to be crazy it means from the material perspective you have to be crazy. Why would you chant Hare Krishna when you can enjoy life? You see, you're so fortunate, you come from a wealthy family and you've got the chance to be in Manipal, you should take it. There's so many people who would cut off their left arm to have such an opportunity. And so many people, they're simply struggling they're working hard all day to earn 50 rupees. You have this opportunity, you can, you can blow your nose with a 50 rupee note. And so why don't you take it? Instead you're chanting Hare Krishna. People can't understand. You have to be crazy. But then again Prabhupada wrote that essay, who is crazy? Because people used to accuse the devotees. You're all crazy. Jumping around the streets wearing orange bed sheets. In those days they didn't import dotis from India. So they used to get some bed sheets and dye them orange. So jumping around in the streets wearing orange bed sheets with no hair. Very strange. It must be crazy. So Prabhupada, who is crazy? You're all crazy. Why? Because you're not jumping around the streets in orange bed sheets and chatting Hare Krishna. That's what same people do. So apart from jumping around the streets in orange bed sheets, we also have to accept many difficulties, it may be, in serving Krishna. Just like you'll see in, in Poland, Indra Yumna Maharaj's festivals are very famous all summer. They go from one place to another and big festivals just with lots of prasad and lots of kirtan. It's, it's very blissful. Lots of kirtan, lots of prasad, and they get all the kids to chant and dance with them. But to organize those festivals, you have to go through so many difficulties. Getting permission, and then they have to, there's so much opposition from the Catholic Church, which is very strong there, the Pope is Catholic. Getting enough money to do it all, and then getting the devotees organized, because, you know, everyone has their own idea. Let's do it like this, let's do it like that, and so many things. 